right. Hi. Welcome, everyone. You having a good time so far? Yeah. A couple quick announcements. Um, one is we had a cancellation right after me. Uh, Arnie Data Thrash will not be here. Sorry. But we have a replacement speaker, our delightful and charming NSA Key, who's going to be speaking on XMPP. Uh, so that will be uh, right after my talk. It'll be over in track two. Also, um, oh, we have driven away some of the mundanes. The soccer club that was going to be in the hotel has canceled. So we have 40 rooms that have freed up. So if anybody wants to stay in this hotel that hasn't checked in or was staying in one of the satellite hotels, you can move into this hotel now. Okay? All right. So we're going to go. So hi, my name is Ilanka. I am the chairperson of the board of National 2600. I was like pointing at our beautiful signs here. Very proud of those. And I also have a thing about cryptography, which actually started with Freaknik. It all kind of ties in together. And today I'm going to be speaking about one of the world's most famous unsolved codes, which is called the Beale ciphers, or the, the Beale papers. And this was how I got connected into cryptography. Uh, this is the Freaknik 3 code. Uh, it was released at Freaknik 3 as a challenge to the attendees at Freaknik. No one cracked it. So a year later, uh, the folks from Nashville 2600 are at DragonCon down in Atlanta, handing this code out, saying, hey, if you can crack this code, there's going to be a prize. So I picked it up with all the flyers that you get at DragonCon or whatever, and got really obsessed with it and cracked it. Uh, it took me 10 days. I was totally like, all my friends, don't talk to me unless you want to talk about a code. And um, I cracked it, and that's a whole other talk, but I won the prize. Free trip to a hacker con, free picnic for free hotel drinks, t-shirts. Um, not that it's hard to get free drinks at free but, um, <laughs> And then I went cracking a, a bunch of other codes in the hacker scene. I've actually cracked so many I've been banned from competition in the hacker scene. So like when the Atlanta con code came out, the bottom of the sheet of paper, it said, no past puzzle solvers are ineligible for prizes associated with solving the Atlanta con puzzle. Give someone else a chance, Ilanka. So, I cracked that one too. Um, so, um, so this is kind of how I got involved in the whole crypto thing. And while I was getting involved with crypto, I, I started getting involved with taking a look at some of the world's most famous unsolved codes. And there wasn't really a good list of unsolved codes, so I created one. This is on my website, yuanka.com. And it's just been really popular. It's gotten like over 5 million page views so far. And the number one code that I list is something called the Beale ciphers. Uh, this is the list that I have, Beale ciphers. It's a very subjective list here. Uh, Voynich Manuscript, Dorabella cipher, Zodiac Killer. I'm actually crossing off KO cipher because that one's been solved. Not because someone cracked it so much as the guy's family donated all his notes to the National Cryptologic Museum. So we were able to go in and kind of see what, what uh, you know, how it worked. And it wasn't really impressive <laughs> once we got to take a look at it. But cross that one off the list. Um, I can also give talks on a bunch of these others, but they tried to limit the number of talks I'm giving. Uh, so today we talk about field papers. So I was also a talking head on a show called Myth Hunters. I'm just going to play you a few minutes of that. A group of men bury a fabulous treasure in the Virginia countryside. With gold and silver and jewels worth tens of millions of dollars. Their leader, Thomas Beale, writes down the treasure's location in a secret code. He entrusts an innkeeper with its safekeeping, vowing to return. But then Thomas Beale vanishes. Not only does Thomas Beale disappear, his whole party disappears. It's a complete mystery. Years later, two brothers, George and Clayton Hart, take up the challenge of cracking Beale's mysterious code to recover his glittering treasure. 
During their 50 year quest, they turn to the world's most famous code breakers. And even the supernatural. But when someone is hot on the trail of a treasure, they will use every possible means at their disposal. <coughs> a seance was science. He genuinely believes that mesmerism will uncover the location of this treasure. Theirs is an extraordinary quest to unravel the mystery of Thomas Beale's lost treasure. Oh, um, exciting stuff. Okay. So I won't take you through all the mesmerism stuff. I'll take you. Pretty much we're going to focus on just the code part of it. So, Everything that is known about the Beale Papers comes from one pamphlet which uh, was published in the 1880s. And it has a really interesting story to it. It's written in a very dramatic style. Um, oops, I've got to turn off presenter view so that we don't cut things off. Eventually we'll get this figured out. Optimizing. Optimizing. <laughs> Technology is our friend. Okay, so um, this one pamphlet, which was published in the late 1880s, described the story of a guy named Thomas Beale, or Thomas J. Beale, um, who reportedly had showed up in Bedford County, Virginia, in around 1819, 1821, with some wagons of stuff, um, which he then disappeared with, and then he went away again, and before he left, he According to the story, according to the pamphlet, he entrusted this lockbox to the innkeeper, Robert Morris, um, and said, uh, if I don't return in a certain amount of time, open the box. And then he, later he sent a letter from St. Louis saying, okay, um, a, there's some encrypted letters in this box and a friend of mine will send the key to you. Well, the key was never sent. So many years later, Morris opened the box found various letters that he could read and a few messages that he could not read. It was a series of numbers. According to the story, Morris couldn't make sense of the numbers. As he got older, he passed them off to an unnamed friend. This unnamed friend spent some time looking at it and then cracked one of the three <coughs> messages using the Declaration of Independence. And it was a book cipher. And in this cracked message, it said things about uh, Beale had buried treasure within a few miles of the area, four miles from Buford's Tavern. So this is the approximate location of Virginia, Bedford County near uh, Lynchburg. And so the pamphlet, I won't go into great details, but the pamphlet is written in a very kind of purple prose style. Um, so Morris in the pamphlet as, he, as he's describing Beale as saying, in person he was about six feet in height with jet black eyes and hair of the same color, worn longer than was the style at that time. His form was symmetrical and gave evidence of unusual strength and activity. He was a model of manly beauty, <laughs> favored by the ladies and envied by the men. <laughs> so, okay, so we got that, all right? So also the pamphlet reproduced various letters. There was an 1820, at first it reproduced a May 1822 letter from Beale in St. Louis writing to Morris saying that the key was left with a friend. Um, then the pamphlet reproduces a January 1822 letter from Beale who's now in Lynchburg um, to Morris describing this adventure of how he'd come across all this gold. And then also a letter from Beale the next day and again in Lynchburg to Morris saying, that one of the enciphered messages would contain the names of <coughs> to whom the treasure belonged. <coughs> so in the pamphlet, there are also these three encrypted messages, two, one, and three. <coughs> and the story was that in 1817, Beale, a man of, of a, uh, a gentlemanly family in Virginia, along with 30 other gentlemen adventurers, had headed west to hunt buffalo by accident they discovered gold and silver about 300 miles north of Santa Fe. 
They then spent a year and a half, 18 months, with no one hearing about it, mining this treasure. Then they decided what they were going to do about it. Two wagon shipments were sent back to Virginia, where Beale buried them within four miles of Buford's Tavern. If you hear a note of skepticism in my voice, this is accurate. I have a lot of skepticism about this story. So, again, according to the story, Beale gave this lockbox to the innkeeper in 1922. Um, and then <clears throat> he sent the letter, 1832. Uh, Morris opens the box 23, 23 years later in 1845, passes it off to a friend. And then the friend solves one of them with the Declaration of Independence, then decides he's done with the whole thing, <clears throat> writes this pamphlet, and has it published by Ward in 1885. So this is what paper number one looks like. It's a series of numbers. Paper number two, also a big series of numbers. All right, so the decryption of paper two, this is the Declaration of Independence. You probably can't see it, but it says, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political, you know, on and on. So if we number each word, so here's paper two. We got the numbers are 115, 73, 24, 807, 37, 52. So we go to the 115th word, Declaration of Independence, which is the word instituted. We take the first letter, which is an I. Then we go to the 73rd word, which is hold. We take an H. 24th word, which is another, we take an A. Keep going like that, and you get I H A V E. I have. Okay. So we go all the way through there. Paper number two says, I have deposited in the county of Bedford, about four miles from Buford's, in an excavation or vault six feet below the surface of the ground, the following articles, belonging jointly to the parties whose names are given in number three herewith. The first deposit consisted of 1,014 pounds of gold and 3,812 pounds of silver, deposited November 1819. The second was made December 1821 and consisted of 1,907 pounds of gold and 1,288 pounds of silver, also jewels, obtained in St. Louis in exchange for silver to save transportation and valued at $13,000. The above is securely packed in iron pots with iron covers. The vault is roughly lined with stone, and the vessels rest on solid stone and are covered with others. Paper number one describes the exact locality of the vault so that no difficulty will be had in finding it. Okay. So I can tell a bunch of you, you're like itching to go get a shovel, right? <laughs> go run out to Bedford County, which many people have done, generations of people have done. Then this is paper three, which supposedly came, contains the names and residences of the people to whom the treasure belongs. But a common question is, why would you encode the names of the people to whom the treasure belongs? Also, there's 618, about 618 numbers here. And supposedly, this contains the names and residences of 30 different people, 30 people, where they live, the names of their relatives. And that's a lot of information to put in a small set of numbers. Now, granted, there's compression algorithms and all kinds of fun things you can do. But we're, again, we're talking 1800s here. Um, how much would the treasure be worth? It depends how you value it. Roughly $54 million. We'll, we'll leave it at that. Okay. <coughs> so many people have tried to solve it. The two men that were mentioned in the video, Clayton and George Hart, real individuals. One of them actually became a judge in Washington, D.C. There's an article on Wikipedia about him. Um, so they, they spent about 50 years working on the code. Uh, hired psychics, went out into the countryside with dynamite to blow up trees where the psychics were pointing and, and, and had no luck. Um, they, they've tried dowsing pendulums and people have come with modern equipment, you know, tractors. They basically have leveled hills <laughs> around Buford's Tavern, within four miles of Buford's Tavern. Nothing's been found. So what is it? Is it a real code or was it just a hoax? Was it an urban legend of, of the time? I mean, there's, there's so many questions. A lot of work has been done in analyzing the, the, the language and the pamphlet. Supposedly, it contained letters from Beale, letters from Morris, and also this unnamed friend who wrote all this. And, and they, things have been found that raise questions. For example, supposedly, there's a letter from Beale in the 1820s where he's talking about when they're hunting buffalo in a stampede. Well, Stampede was not a word that was really used in the 1820s. It really didn't come into the language until the 1880s. Uh, other words were like improvise and uproar. So those raised some flags. Also, in the whole, the whole sniff test, okay? 
you know, you've got three wagons full of precious metals that are shipped all the way back from this area around Denver, Albuquerque area, all the way back to Virginia. Why? They went through St. Louis, a perfectly good town with banks. They, all, they had already exchanged some of this gold for gems to make it easier to carry. Why not exchange it all for gems? Why take it all the way to Virginia? Also, there's no other independent sources of information, just this one pamphlet. There's been a lot of work done. It was Thomas Beale a real individual? Well, there's been a lot of work looking at censuses in the Virginia area. There is no Thomas Beale listed, but it's not necessarily suspicious because it wasn't like censuses today where they're trying to count every single person. Back then, they just wanted to get a census of who lives in this area. Okay, it's the Beale family. Move on and go to the next one. So there might have been a Thomas Beale, but Again, just kind of pointing out that going all the way from the west all the way back to Virginia, long journey. Um, other statistical inconsistencies, the, uh, the, number, the, the amount of numbers, and paper one goes to number 2,906. Well, the Declaration of Independence only has 1,322 words, but it might have been against some other document. But someone doing it by hand is going to get really bored, but you can put a computer on it. So Jim Globley computer scientist, used to be head of the American Cryptogram Association. He put a, he did a lot of things. One of the things is he put a computer on paper one with the Declaration of Independence, and he found a really interesting string halfway through that came up, A, B, F, D, E, F, G, H, I, I, J, K, L, and that. So it doesn't look random, but why would it be there? And the theory is, is that someone was using the Decla Declaration of Independence in some way and got really bored and so was trying to do the letters of the alphabet. Some of those letters that aren't exact alphabet, there's, the numbers are just one off, so it looks like a fatigue kind of error. Now there's still controversy about it. Some people say, okay, that proves it's a hoax. And others are saying, no, it proves that there was just one layer of encryption and there's another layer on top. So if anyone wants to continue working on it, you know, feel free. Um, I told you about all the, the paper three, trying to fit all that information, 618 characters. Also, why encrypt three pages and why use different methods for each paper? That doesn't make a lot of sense. And big one for me, could 30 men have mined gold for a year and a half and kept it in absolute secret? It's, it's very doubtful to me. Think about the miners, the 49ers in California. Sutter, and they tried to keep that secret, and boom, secret got out really fast. So the idea that a year and a half, 30 men keeping it a secret, <coughs> doesn't fly with me. Um, a little thing about, the in the story, the pamphlet says this unnamed friend numbered the papers from one to three, but then in the deciphered text, it said, go look at paper number one, look at paper number three. So, so there's a, a timing problem there. Um, also, some very smart people who study the English language have gone in and looked at the vocabulary and the style of the letters, comparing Beale's language, Morris's language, the unnamed friend's language, to the language of some other educated person around that time period. For example, a judge. The way letters were written, and they're, they're looking at things like, I don't even understand all these passive constructions, infinitives, negatives, relative clauses, and negative passives, and they found that they feel that the entire thing was written by one person. It, it's very unlikely that the letters were written by different people. Other things, I don't know if anyone here studies geology. If you're looking for gold on the surface of the earth, it doesn't really pop up as, ooh, there's gold. There's, there's a lot of other things that'll show up. And, and there's some other things saying, oh, we traveled, we went 250 miles uh, on foot in, in rough terrain, and it's yeah, a little suspicious. Um, there's some theories that the thing is all related to a Freemasonry, and Ward, who published the pamphlet, was a master mason. Freemasonry uses a lot of references to rock and stone, and in this whole pamphlet, the treasure was in a cleft in the rocks. It was a secret vault. This thing about hope that all that is dark in them may receive light. That's, that's all very Masonic. So if, if the pamphlet was not real, who wrote it? The, the leading theory is a guy named John William Sherman. He was a playwright and a journalist. He had a lot of business connections to Ward. In fact, he was the first cousin of James Ward. And he had purchased the Lynchburg, Virginia newspaper shortly after the pamphlet had been sold. And the newspaper ran into financial difficulties and was then dissolved. And the, this uh, 
pamphlet was advertised many, many times, 84 times in the Virginian, never in any other paper in the area. So that implies that someone who was associated with the newspaper was able to put this ad over and over and over again in the newspaper. Also at the very bottom where it says address WW Watts 1001 Main Street, 1001 Main Street is the address of the newspaper and WW Watts was a paper boy at the newspaper. <laughs> um, also before the pamphlet had come out, there was another story that was in the Virginian in 1879 talking about supposedly a real story, that $65,000 had been found. A, uh, a veteran, I believe, of the Civil War had buried his gold in the back of a Kentucky cave in an old sugar kettle in the back of the cave one mile south of town, which was the same as four miles from Buford's town. So maybe he was using that as the inspiration for his story. Um, some would say that this whole thing may have been a fable used by the Masons. There's this story about a farmer and his sons. The farmer's dying and he wants to impart to his sons a secret. He wants the farm to, to prosper. And so he tells them that out in the vineyard there's a treasure that's hidden in the vineyard. And he says, go look and you will find it. So after he dies, the sons take their, their equipment and go out and they're digging all the time in the vineyard, looking for this treasure, looking for this treasure. They never find it but the crop is really, really good because they're out in the fields all the time. So the family prospers, not because of the treasure, but because of the search for the treasure. And I believe very strongly in this with codes, working on an unsolved code. I may never crack the code, but I'm gonna learn a lot of other stuff while I'm working on trying to crack that code. So if you'd like more information about the Beale Papers, uh, I do have a book, Secret Codes and Cryptograms, that article about finding the alphabetic string was written by Jim Gologly in 1980. The article is called A Dissenting Opinion. There's been kind of a back and forth in the cryptographic literature about Beale papers. Is it real? Is it not real? Uh, Cryptologia with articles by Carl Hammer. And of course, you can just go to scholar.google.com and find a lot of stuff. So, summary. All information about the ciphers comes from this one pamphlet published in 1885. It's likely a hoax or a story, just a fictional story that was written as a way to sell pamphlets and then people just ignored the fact that it might be fiction and just keep going out there and digging holes. But the lure of an as yet unfound fabulous treasure continues to intrigue treasure seekers. So I say if you want to do the search, go for it. Enjoy the search. Thank you. Any questions? I didn't hear you say, but I saw on one of the slides that they were also associated with people that own the tavern mm -hmm. that could draw a lot of business in. Right. Uh, to repeat the question, that there was also an association with the people that owned the tavern. Yes. And, and if, it, if it was Sherman who wrote it, that he had these family connections over there to the tavern, could definitely have brought business there. Plus, he was just writing about something he knew. Uh, also, I have a about the. Uh, oh. Oh, we need to get that mic in a box he can just throw. <laughs> you had mentioned the names. Is this on? <laughs> Hello. Okay. On one of the slides, you talked about the uh, the names being encrypted of the people it was going to, and their addresses, and their family, and everything. Mm -hmm. Since they were using historical documents anyway, mm -hmm. uh, people in Virginia would have been named after people in England or Scotland. The towns would have been named after people in England and Scotland. The street names would have been the same way. Uh, if they were using historic documents, the Book of Kells mm -hmm. would have had people's names. It would have had land amounts that were transferred, silver and gold that was transferred between people. And with three numbers, you could have a page number, a paragraph, a line, a word, and it would give you a full family name. You could get the address. You could get the street number. Um, and all of that could easily be done in half that space. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible. It's very possible. Anything's possible. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so uh, two announcements. Again, uh, NSA Key will be speaking at, what is it, 1 o'clock? Yeah. So that's in a half hour in track two. And there's extra hotel rooms that have opened up if anyone wants to stay in this hotel. Thank you again.